so it's my great pleasure to do, to introduce to you uh professor dr david anson he is associate professor of theory and uh, comparative literature at uh, grand texas rio university rio valley university in texas and uh, myself and david we studied together at state university of new york stony brook so david is my colleague too and uh, david uh, has very keen interest in uh, marxist literary theory and cultural studies uh, right from his student days and today uh, we are going to benefit from his lecture on ancient quarrel between poetry and philosophy so over to you david thank you thank you very much and i do want to thank all of the students for coming and uh the faculty and administration at the kalinga institute of arts and technology and my old uh, friend and uh, colleague dr pandey uh, dr bernardra pandey for the opportunity to talk about this today and my my talk uh is you know called the ancient quarrel uh does art promote ideology or critique it. And as I'm going, if anyone has any questions or anything, I don't mind if people uh, ask me to stop or explain something or if something I say is unclear, um, don't don't worry about it. Um, that would be fine. So <clears throat> the phrase, the ancient quarrel, first gets used by Plato, speaking through Socrates, in his famous dialogue in Book 10 of the Republic, as most of us may know, The Republic is a book of political theory, an attempt to draw an image of, or discuss the logic of, a kind of ideal government Plato uh, envisions for his utopia. Plato himself, in this dialogue, refers to the, quote, ancient quarrel between poetry and philosophy in Book 10, after a prolonged discussion about the problems of poetry, the poetic, and also poets for the construction of a good society. He famously says that in the Republic, uh, poets would be banned. Uh, they wouldn't be allowed uh, to uh, you know, perform or uh, write or, or speak because they represent a danger uh, to the good society. Um, and uh, uh, in, by the way, in this talk, I'm going to use Plato and Socrates interchangeably because uh, we have no way of knowing to what degree Socrates is a literary device, uh, or we might say, ironically, a poetic device for Plato versus a real person, Socrates, whose ideas can be reproduced accurately. So I'm just going to link Socrates and Plato together. Uh, in contrast, Aristotle defends the value of art for philosophy in his famous Poetics. He implicitly, never explicitly, argues with Plato about the pedagogic and ethical value of literature, and their opposing positions form the original quarrel known uh, in history as the uh, ancient quarrel. I will say that Aristotle doesn't uh, uh, polemicize against Plato, who was his teacher uh, and was well regarded, uh, but he does mention in passing uh, when he lists the uh, the the masters of uh, imitative art and dialogues. He mentions Plato amongst several other people, without ever acknowledging that this is part of uh, critiquing Plato, because Plato uh, theoretically would not want to be equated with the imitative arts uh, and poetry, which he's been condemning. Uh, although the the irony of reading uh, Plato alongside Aristotle is that Plato is much more poetic. The whole form of his dialogues is a kind of, you know, similar to theater. Whereas when we read Aristotle, it's more like reading a dry, boring uh, scientist or doctor dissecting and analyzing the features of uh, tragedy 
uh, comedy, epic, and the kinds of uh, uh, poetic arts that were known at that time in ancient Greece. But anyway, uh, uh, Plato slash Socrates and Aristotle both uh, make their arguments from the point of view of a philosopher, not a poet or a uh, advocate of uh, art as pure pleasure, but they both agree that the goal and purpose of art would be or should be to educate and make people uh, better uh, citizens, better moral agents, uh, even though they disagree uh, about the effect of, of, of art. Um, and uh, they both tend to, to focus on the questions of, like I said, politics and ethics and morality, although, um, and, and therefore they see art more as instruction than delight, although uh, Aristotle does make some points about the value uh, of pleasure and enjoyment in theater, uh, in contrast to Plato, who pretty much consistently distrusts this for reasons I will get into. Um, in effect, you know, Plato finds art, uh, what he calls imitations, what we would today call reproductions, uh, and imaginative products in general, an obstacle to philosophy. Uh, and I'm using philosophy here not as a academic discipline in a narrow sense, but in a much broader sense. Uh, for both, philosophy refers to or signifies a road to truth, wisdom, rational and just politics, good government, the values and knowledge that makes one a good human, and the teaching of people to be both good citizens and good humans. Plato writes, quote, when you encounter admirers of Homer who say that this poet is the tutor of Greece, that to study him is to refine human conduct and culture, and that we should live our entire lives in accordance with his precepts, you must welcome them and love them as people who are doing the best they can. Uh, if we extend this critique of Plato's beyond Homer to the entire range of artistic, aesthetic, literary, cultural products, creations, since the term poetic stands in for all of these in this discussion, then Plato advocates humoring those of us in the fields of literary study uh, or the humanities more broadly, who have the conviction that the aesthetic and cultural can and does civilize us and teach us how to live. We are, in his words, quote, doing the best we can, which suggests those of us who do believe in the value of imaginative products, or to use his and Aristotle's term again, imaginations, I'm sorry, imitations, uh, which today would be equivalent to representations, those of us who value this are basically dim-witted, somewhat foolish, though well-intentioned, yet we remain hopelessly deceived. Indeed, I, like most people, probably most of us, who dedicate their professional life, their academic life, their energies, principles, and passions to the study of literature and culture, do so for precisely the reasons Plato ridicules. We believe that imagination can, quote, refine human conduct and culture. We think that works of art and literature can deepen our empathy with other people, can make us better people, and can help us understand the world in new and important ways that are truthful. But uh, Plato has a very strong argument against this set of assumptions that we gravitate to. So we need to take Plato's critique and its contemporary variants seriously in order to ensure that our work does actually achieve the noble ambitions that we often hope for. Further, those of us who do political, economic, historical, and aesthetic analysis of texts, clearly, whether consciously or not, to devote ourselves to criticism with the conviction that if humans read better, they think better and society will be better. We believe that literature contains significant truth values. Whether we champion some kind of realism 
understood as an approach to literature that values texts that are like the real world or reality or the real. Or on the other hand, if we favor avant-garde modernist or postmodernist critics, artists, and writing, uh, and we do so generally because we believe that such works are an approach uh, to art through non-realist means that, however, uh, uh, remain in a dialectic with the real, no matter how radical the form the writing takes, and no matter how much the imagination seems different from a literal experience of the real world. Uh, in other words, some stories uh, approach the truth straightforwardly and others in a more roundabout, circuitous route. On the one hand, Plato's arguments in their strongest form come to the complete opposite conclusion. He argues the poetic deals with appearances and these block our access to reality and truth. And except for the most depoliticized, sanitized art, which he argues is the only kind that should be allowed in the Republic, um, except for this depoliticized art, uh, all other art uh, is dangerous in various ways, which we'll get into. Uh, Plato doesn't have a problem with all poetry in the Republic. He just explains that there can't be any that um, criticizes the leaders, that makes the god or gods look bad, or that teach things like war and sacrifice for the state are, are, are mistaken. So he condemns, for example, Homer for in the uh, Iliad, when Achilles is debating whether or not to fight in the war because of his anger with Agamemnon, uh, Achilles expresses fear of dying. Later in the um, Odyssey, or maybe before, since we don't know for sure, in the Odyssey, Achilles is met by, I think it's Telemachus in the underworld, and he says it's better to be a slave alive in the world than to be dead in the underworld. A king of the underworld is not as good as a slave in the uh, real, in the physical world. And this particularly bothers Plato because he feels that how can you promote a culture and society where people don't fear death, where they don't fear the gods, where they don't fear the authorities, and they don't fear war, which to be fair, you know, uh, Plato was, was developing these ideas after the Peloponnesian War and a whole series of, of political and social turmoils in Greece that were very destructive. So, you know, he felt that it was necessary for citizens to have the values of courage and the values of uh, willingness to sacrifice for the society or the state. And uh, anything that disparaged that or even acknowledged that people might have other views would be dangerous. And, you know, one thinks about uh, in contemporary times, at least in the United States, there's often a lot of campaigns to encourage people uh, to join the military because of different military conflicts. And again, it's this idea that if you uh, don't do that, um, you are not being a good citizen. Anyway, um, uh, to go back to the discussion, um, uh, uh, Plato argues that the poetic merely deals with appearances, illusions, imitations, and these block uh, our access to reality. Therefore, most of us, whether consciously or not, tend to side with Aristotle. We believe that literature educates, deepens empathy, and transforms readers, or we wouldn't be making the choice to make careers as people who devote our lives to the promotion of the reading, scholarship, and teaching of literature. It is worth noting that worldwide, the humanities and literature, as part of a broad liberal education, face assault by a capitalist culture that demands results and pragmatic purposes for education, not something as nebulous as critical thought or, quote, philosophy in the broader sense as a level of wisdom. But leaving aside today's market-driven pedagogic priorities 
It is my contention, as I will briefly argue in this talk, that the ancient quarrel, which I think should be thought of as the Plato-Aristotle debate on the value of literature uh, for ethics, politics, and wisdom, actually is a debate that has continued on basically in one form or another, uninterrupted, and continues to the present time. Um, I will further argue that political criticism of all kinds, but particularly in including Marxist criticism, feminist criticism, criticism focusing on the environment, post-coloniality, or gender criticism, as well as virtually all th critical theoretical schools still uh, revolve, even if unacknowledged, uh, around this Plato-Aristotle debate on the value of imitative arts and whether such arts can actually produce truth. And surprisingly, Plato, as well as Aristotle, still remains a key reference point, even for people who have not given up on the possibility of useful uh, political art or useful uh, uh, intellectual art, uh, but they borrow forms of his critique in their analysis. So ironically or not, uh, these figures still, I think, need to be drawn out uh, and, uh, and thought about explicitly. Uh, just as the philosopher Alfred Lord Whitehead famously said that all philosophy is a footnote to Plato, I'm tempted to say that all literary theory is a footnote to this ancient quarrel. To return to Plato's description of the ancient quarrel, he writes, unless we be convicted of a certain harshness and parochialism, let us remind that there is an old quarrel between philosophy and poetry. But since his is the first description of this old quarrel, we don't really, I'm sorry, my cat in the background is making a lot of noise. Um, we don't necessarily know uh, what the other figures in this debate prior to Plato and Aristotle felt. Plato gives some examples of attacks on philosophy, allegedly made by supporters of poetry or poets, such as labeling philosophy, quote, the bitch that yelps and bays at her master, quote, great in the conversation of simpletons, a company of otherwise fools, and refined thinkers who are really beggars. These and other reproaches mark the ancient antagonism, he ends. But these alleged criticisms of philosophers by poets make us, can't help but make us feel it's a bit of a straw man argument because they're not really arguments, they're just attacks. We might wonder if this, the only voice of the poets discernible in these ancient and Western texts, really represents a fair challenge to Plato's dismissal of the poetic. Clearly, the defense mounted by Aristotle in his Poetics, where he argues that, quote, imitation and play naturally delights and promotes learning in children and all humans who desire and enjoy learning. Uh, this is, by the way, an observation uh, made by Aristotle that later in a very similar form gets utilized by Freud uh, in a similar defense of literary interpretation, where Freud says that uh, play uh, is the big basis for um, dreams, fantasies, and for imaginative writing, that we write because we want to imagine uh, our fantasies or our hopes or our dreams. And it like uh, dreams themselves for Freud, the censorship mechanism is down because people tend to take uh, literature less seriously than say direct essays about politics or jurisprudence or other kinds of uh, matters that are more overtly uh, controversial. Aristotle argues that the lack of reality in tragic drama, unlike uh, Plato, actually makes fictional imitations more philosophic than history, than the study of history, since history is only concerned with what happened while literature depicts or can depict if it's done right and how things should be. Uh, Aristotle goes on to say that uh, that that um, like, for example, tragedy 
uh, is only dealing with the particular, but uh, but uh, I'm sorry, history is only dealing with the particular events that actually took place. But for, but poetry and the arts can and, and you know narrative can uh, move to the from the particular to the general and are more inducive of wisdom because they don't just deal with what happened. They deal with what could have happened, what should have happened, and what needs to happen. So this fight between poetry and philosophy becomes a fight between two philosophers on the value for knowledge and justice of the imaginative reproductions known as art, which in this discussion will be used by the label poetic. Yet the issues engaged in this discussion are not limited by contemporary academic disciplines and divisions, but rather, as I will continue to suggest, gets to the center of some of the most important questions that recur in literary theory and criticism up to the present time. It is important to understand the contours of the positions of Plato and Aristotle in relation to their varying assessments of the value of literature, cultural representations, art, et cetera. Uh, and similarly, uh, by philosophy, I hope to demonstrate that what is actually at stake is a whole range of important issues lumped together, which center on the effects of the artistic for making people more ethical. Uh, it remains at the center of literary debates and discussions throughout history and remains central even to contemporary readings of literature and representations, especially for those of us concerned with the politics and ethics in the world and in literature and culture and their relations. Um, in particular, since my main critical focus concerns Marxist or political approaches to literature, I will review how important recent critics and theorists can be understood in relation to the issues and disagreements between Plato and Aristotle. Indeed, I will trace their influence or affinity within certain influential Marxist critics and other kinds of critics and their approach to political and cultural criteria for art. Although there are fascinating moments throughout Plato's dialogues as a whole, where he debates on writing, for example, in the Phaedrus, which there's a famous uh, essay by Jacques Derrida, the deconstructive critic that responds to that essay, or in his Ion, he debates uh, the question of where poetic inspiration comes from, whether it comes from, whether it's an art, uh, a craft, or whether it's the product of God. Um, it's actually the arguments in the Republic that I think are most uh, significant. And I wanna review, he offers several very precise reasons why the poets, unless they profoundly limit their approach their creativity and agree to the censorship that he thinks is necessary are in his mind necessarily dangerous to the public order. First, again, just to reiterate the po how the poetic is being used by Plato and its implications for today. For Plato, poetry refers to the imaginative, the imitative reproductions, which he believes are pretty much necessarily false disorient people, make them bad, and in contemporary discussions, we would say are thoroughly ideological. Um, the worlds uh, created in epic, myth, drama, comedy give false appearances that block and distort truth. The poet, poetic therefore remains harmful to the education of philosopher kings and all children, and by extension, all people, uh, and therefore should be banned. Uh, why? The first major argument that Plato makes is his famous ontological argument, his famous claim that artistic reproductions are just a copy of a copy. Uh, by this, Plato makes his famous argument that ideas, forms, are universal timeless truths, ideas that presuppose the material world and its creations, whether by nature imitation. For example, he makes his famous argument about three types of beds. He starts with the one that is furthest from the truth, which would be a painting or say a literary description of a bed. He says, this is an imitation of a real bed in the material world and 
uh, you can't even sleep on a painting of a bed. So it serves no purpose except mere ornamentation and uh, perhaps uh, misunderstanding. The second type of bed is the bed that the craftsman makes, the empirical bed in the material world. But Plato also says, this is an imitation, strangely, that the things we encounter in the material world uh, presuppose pre-existing ideas and concepts. Uh, a bed can be destroyed, it can fall apart, uh, it can be poorly made, uh, it can be inadequate. So beds in the material world are still imitations, imitations of the timeless universal concept of the bed that presupposes, according to Plato, the making of any individual bed. You can't make a bed, Plato argues in effect, if you don't already have a pre-existing concept of the bed, and only the concept, the generalization, the category, the form, has real truth outside of the contingencies of time and space. Uh, for Plato, whether correct or not, the only thing that's worthy of being called truth are things that are universal and timeless, that escape uh, the momentary and the fragmentary. So... Therefore, as we say, uh, you know, a work of art is a copy of a copy in Plato's ontology. Interestingly, this dovetails with a contemporary structuralist, post-structuralist, and deconstructive views that critique concepts of origin, author, creativity, or even ideas of language as referential. For example, the critic Jacques Derrida, who basically invented deconstruction, borrows from the French structural linguist uh, Ferdinand de Saussure the idea that language has no positive terms, no meaning separate from differences. And one easy example is, uh, you know, three words in English, cat, rat, and bat. Uh, when we use these words, uh, we have no way of knowing uh, in themselves, if we just had each individual word separate and isolated, whether we were referring to the furry creature who uh, often jumps in front of my computer when I'm giving lectures and makes noises versus the vermin that spreads disease versus the flying bat. The only thing that allows us to distinguish these three, two, these three words and the referent that they have is the letter B, C, or R. So that's arbitrary. And therefore, uh, Saussure and Derrida following him uh, argue that there is no positive terms in language. There's just a uh, meaning that is created through differences. Further, in effect, following the German philosopher Immanuel Kant, uh, we might say that whatever we know through our senses or language, what we think we know is merely a phenomena for us, not things as they really are. Therefore, all representations of reality, whether fictional stories or language itself, uh, according to this argument of the deconstructive critics, is already mediated by a system of language differences. Similarly, literary stories are already part of a system of literature in which they are only distinguishable by their differences from each other. So if we follow this logic, many have concluded that the implication is that words in a strict sense never directly reference the world. Uh, similarly, some gender theorists like Judith Butler argue that gender differences i.e. identifying as a man or a woman, as gay or, homo or straight, uh, only function as a performance, an act that only has the system of gender as a reference, but no original, valid, universal, or easily definable concept of men, women, straight or gay outside of historical, cultural, or performative values. In a broader way, any critique of literature for its lack of truthfulness or realism or its ideological features follows this point of Plato. Before we dismiss this claim 
we might remember that the subject of many representations themselves are how representations fail. And we might also point out that one of the major ways that people have looked at art and history critically is by asking the question, does this present representations that adequately represent the material, or is it rather cultural constructs? You know, we can think of the works of Edward Said, early works in Orientalism, where he argues that all texts are sort of, uh, in the European tradition, I should say, are uh, a priori uh, infected with conceptions of the other that distort reality and that it's not possible to extricate the reality from the body of texts that he calls Orientalist that uh, have dominated Western uh, culture. The second criticism of Plato's is that Homer or the poets are unreliable because they allegedly don't know much about the subjects they write about. If Homer knew about wars, as a good patriot, he would have been a general or politician. This argument offers two points. One, a writer should write for amusement, but not as an expert or a guidance for life, because they are not qualified at anything beyond creating amusement. If they were, they would serve as producers of laws or justice directly. This is a form of the old saying that those who can do something do it, and those who can't write it or teach about it. The second problem or assumptions of this argument is, in my opinion, that I would offer, is that it ignores that there may be different kinds of knowledge or different ways of transmitting and understanding knowledge, rather than just literally having the experience of being a general, for example. But we get such arguments today, going back to the m method of uh, literary criticism that was dominant in the United States and Britain in the 50s and 60s, which was called New Criticism, where the new critics, who were formalists, argued for the intrinsic formal reading of texts without reference to politics, ethics, or history, just evaluating literature based on internal criteria uh, without making any kind of uh, argument external to the text. Historians, political theorists, political theorists, or journalists are those qualified, according to this argument, to talk about broader subjects, whereas those who read or write well should be limited to doing this. Textual analysis, such a view holds, must be separated from any concern other than the mechanisms in which aesthetic pleasure is produced intrinsically as a self-contained artistic object. Such objects should not be confused with other fields of knowledge, the argument runs, and if writers or critics were really insightful about politics or psychology or making society better, they would devote their time to these fields rather than the artistic creation of works of fiction or uh, commenting on uh, works of fiction. However, this argument really reflects assumptions based on an unquestioned acceptance of a deep and permanent division of labor where different types of people remain condemned to different roles and fates. However much such assumptions dovetail with the newly emerging division of labor in ancient Greek societies at Plato's time and also work into the academic division of labor into distinct disciplines, which we live through today, the increasing trend towards democracy in general and democracy and in information since Plato's time may give us reasons to question this logic. The um, Marxist critic Terry Eagleton in his uh, important, uh, useful introductory book, um, Literary Theory has a chapter called The Rise of English where he argues that in Britain and the United States uh, and in Europe in general, the study of literature was largely the result of the post-French revolutionary period when uh, literary critics were uh, and uh, literature was valued as a means of containing people and as a means of, quote unquote, civilizing them so they wouldn't carry out other revolutionary kinds of activities following the French Revolution. And he also argues that it was done because they needed a way to, def to define the discipline. How do you distinguish between 
you know, biography, philology, other, you know, fields, rhetoric that were similar from literary study proper, other than just limiting yourself to the literary object. So in a sense, it's like a, an intellectual justification that's linked to uh, the needs of an academic, emerging academic discipline, which, you know, should perhaps make us suspicious. Uh, the third point that a uh, major point that Plato offers is he condemns the imaginative arts on effective grounds or the way they overwhelm the spectators and appeal to their emotions. This, the effective response we have to the poets for Plato challenges rational decision-making in several ways. Plato gives examples of strong men crying in theaters as an example of the problem. He, Plato argues that when we encounter real suffering or crisis, the generally accepted best thing to do is to master the emotions or keep one's grieving private, whereas the theater overwhelms us with emotions. This is a critique that many people have applied to film studies, to the, you know, to uh, Brecht, as we'll talk about a little bit later, are, has a similar fear about the power of the theater uh, to delude us. And it's not an, uh, uh, you know, the idea that, that literature can't be trusted because it appeals to our emotions rather than our reason or literature or poetry or so forth is a continuous issue in political criticism in various ways. Um, while in modern times we are generally more accepting of emotions in public, Plato does have a point. Too many emotions uncontrolled in public often seem inappropriate and bad taste at, at, the, at the best. Furthermore, both, interestingly, the left and right worry about the unleashing of emotions due to representations. Traditionally, rightists or conservatives have supported censorship or monitoring of the content and the arts. Their arguments often come very close to Plato's, namely concern and fear that if the public or children consume material inappropriate to them, it will miseducate them, distort their personalities, and make them personally permanently evil. For example, uh, there have been periodically in American history panics that movies, video games, books, or music will create criminal or other unsavory features amongst the young. This led in the late 1920s to Hollywood's Hayes Code, which was a partnership between Hollywood and the government to monitor the type of films made and distributed. It was initiated after an outcry that gangster films, particularly the early Scarface, Public Enemy, and White Heat, romanticized gangster life and allegedly was creating juvenile delinquents, young kids who would see these movies and want to become gangsters uh, to model themselves after their cinematic heroes. Uh, interestingly, this argument was also made with the second uh, Scarface, the one by Brian De Palma in the uh, early 80s, uh, where I have encountered people who argued that after that film, the rise of, of young people becoming like interested in gangster ideology or frameworks, even gangster music, really grew. Uh, the Hayes Code was an attempt to, to fight this, and it ensured that all films remained patriotic, that sexual relations not be depicted or referenced, including the strange idea that a man and a woman, even married, could never be seen in a film on the same bed unless one leg of each remained on the ground. But most significantly, the Hayes Code demanded that all films have the message that crime never pays, which meant the villain of the film or anyone who commits crimes in the film had to be defeated by the end of the movie. Rebel directors like Fritz Lang, who had just fled Nazi Germany because he didn't want imposition uh, on his creative uh, filmmaking, um, subtly fought this with movies similar to his movie, You Only Live Twice, where he does indeed create a Bonnie and Clyde type crime criminal couple that try to flee 
uh, and escape to Mexico because things compel them to commit crimes, only at the end for them to be shot dead in a brutal scene that can't help but, in general, uh, make the audience sympathize with these characters, thereby following the letters of the rules, but using them to undermine the, the rules. Uh, interestingly, uh, literature and it's uh, um, uh, and film itself often offer works that echo Plato's fears. From Don Quixote, one of the first European novels that famously features a hero who goes mad from reading tales of chivalry and knights, tales not realistic at any time, but certainly not when Don Quixote lives, leaving him a status, uh, leaving him to a status coined by Marxist critic George Lukács as a problematic hero because he's in conflict with a world that he doesn't understand and his place in it, to the first, quote, modern novel, Flaubert's Madame Bovary, where the heroine finds herself unable to escape existential ennui due to her life and love failing to live up to its literary models in romance novels, to the film The Matrix, and others which deal with the fear of a simulacrum, a term traceable to Plato, or an illusory world that is so complete it lacks any kind of access to reality. The Matrix and the works of the cultural theorist John Baudrillard share the fear of a loss of epistemological coordinates or even a loss of cognitive mapping, the term used by Marxist critic Frederick Jameson to describe our inability in an information-laden society to access references, origins, or to literally map ourselves and our true conditions in our mind. Before we condemn Plato too quickly, we might note that although his philosophy is idealist, not materialist, and elitist, not egalitarian, a large number of Marxist critics take up uh, a similar, similar positions in effect, condemning poetry or representations in the name of truth. Consider the work of the Frankfurt School and its major thinker, Theodore Adorno, who maintains a thoroughly hostile and pessimistic attitude to so-called mass culture and any art except the most abstract and virtually non-representational, such as the works of Samuel Beckett or music like Schoenenberg's uh, the composer who created atonal music. Uh, we might also notice that Theodore Adorno famously said in the face of uh, Auschwitz and the Holocaust of Jews that from this point on to create poetry was obscene. Uh, so clearly he was arguing that from the point of view of truth and the point of view of fighting for a better world, if you actually create poetry after the horrors of World War II, uh, Auschwitz, and uh, Hiroshima, uh, then you are um, actually um, undermining uh, the real severity of the problems. Another thinker on a very different kind of uh, political thinker, uh, a Marxist thinker who distrusts effective emotional appeals from art is Bertolt Brecht, who believes that such uh, emotional overwhelming leaves spectators or readers in a servile position. In his call for epic theater, he challenges standard aesthetic concerns like literal realism or character identification based on their easily deceptible and ideological features. In effect, he argues that only a distanciation or estrangement effect built into a work of art can allow a proper political response from audiences. Otherwise, one absorbs the ideology of the society, Breck believes, and it is reinforced by what he terms a narcotic effect, which dulls the senses and keeps the masses in line. Um, later Marxist-influenced critics of many stripes maintain forms of, quote, ideology critique. Ideology in this context meaning the ways that the dominant logic of a society are absorbed as natural in that society. We don't tend to spontaneously assume the conditions we live under are unjust or wrong unless those conditions tend to go through a crisis. Um, 
Another interesting example from uh, film studies and from feminism concerns Laura Mulvey's influential feminist psychoanalytic essay, Narrative Cinema and Visual Pleasure, where in good platonic fashion, she argues that narrative cinema, i.e. Hollywood works based on pleasure, needs to create a kind of pleasure that needs to be destroyed, even if it means destroying the pleasure of films. Uh, she says that these films and this tradition of what she calls the male gaze, which is the, according to her, uh, the, the, the standard uh, paradigm for filmmaking, at least uh, classical Hollywood filmmaking, is from a male perspective, that the camera, the positions, the framework creates what she calls the male gaze, uh, which leaves, uh, and this is the male heterosexual gaze, so it therefore leaves um, women and uh, and those who are not heterosexual in a uh, males in a subservient kind of position uh, where they just see themselves as objects, not subjects. This is such a problem, she believes, that the only answer is to destroy narrative cinema and have abstract avant-garde films that don't really have positionality or uh, or point of view uh, in the traditional way that narrative does. Um, to move to Aristotle, um, uh, let me say a few, actually a few other examples. Um, in uh, Roland Barthes' great work, Mythologies, which really inaugurated cultural studies in many ways, he argues that most of the phenomena of daily life operate as texts in a hidden way. And they, they do so with hidden political agendas. So, for example, he has a famous uh, myth essay in his book, which is uh, called The Great Family of Man, which is a critique of a photo exhibit that was dis distributed, uh, you know, in many places in the uh, 50s which showed photos of people from all around the world uh, eating, uh, working, being born and dying. And this um, set of photos juxtaposed together with uh, commentary from various religious uh, texts, uh, particularly the uh, Old and New Testament of the Christian Bible, uh, uh, basically asserts the universality and commonality of the human experience across time and space, which is a nice idea that we are all brothers and sisters. But Roland Barth scores the point that uh, what this covers up, conceals, and ignores was and is the real distinctions that take place amongst different people. Why do some people live uh, in comfortable, pleasurable lives while others eke out a basic existence? Why is work for some satisfying and interesting, maybe not most, uh, and for the vast majority of people, uh, drudgery uh, on a subhuman level in some cases? Uh, and so he basically argues that although this appears to be a work of liberal universalist values, it actually obliterates social, imperialist, racial, and class divisions that actually exist. And this exhibit came about uh, at the beginning of the civil rights movement and the decolonization movement as it really took off in many parts of the world. So he sees this as non-coincidental. Um, similarly, uh, there are other uh, major works like Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle in the 1960s that argue that we live in such a media saturated world that we cannot actually escape an endless set of spectacles that deceive us and that give us a artificial version of what life is and of what uh, it means to have a meaningful life. Aristotle, on the other hand, valorizes aesthetic pleasure and learning, and he says they combine, given the fact that they are done the right way. And by the right way, he has several famous criteria. Uh, you have to have characters who act appropriately, uh, which is obviously, and, and he gives the example of a slave should act like a slave, uh, 
a woman should act like a woman and a king should act like a king, which, although he's defending the value of art, you know, itself is obviously ideological. He also argues that uh, for a tragedy to work properly, there must be certain components like uh, reversal and recognition. The uh, point being that the tragic hero uh, goes through a transformation within the work of art, the narrative, the tragic play, and they transform from a position of uh, being in the top to uh, a reversal where they fall to the bottom. And uh, he argues, therefore, that uh, uh, um, this is necessary because there should be some kind of uh, error, some kind of misrecognition, some kind of tragic flaw that the character cre uh, goes through that leads to their demise. But then uh, there should be a period of recognition at the end of the play where both the characters and the audience realize the moral lessons. So in other words, we do tragedies according to this so that we can learn safely the errors that great people make. Now, ironically, David, these, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? David, uh, yeah. we Am are I running out of time? Yeah, like try to conclude because they may be asking you some questions. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, let me just sort of um, say just a little bit more and then I'll, I'll, I'll end it and we can, I definitely would love to take questions. Um, the, the point is, is that uh, uh, Aristotle argues that if you have exactly the right kind of artistic work, it can be useful. And, you know, if I had time, I could point to a, a whole bunch of uh, contemporary critics who don't take the view either that art is inherently good, although there are some who do have this view, like Schiller in, in German idealism, the Romantics, uh, even the avant-garde traditions like surrealism that value art itself as a break from uh, the day-to-day -day, uh, regimentation of existence. Uh, but the point being that, um, that uh, for Aristotle, there's gotta be the right kind of storytelling or it defeats its purpose. I'll just say, um, to me, these are still questions. When I do my work on contemporary culture and television and films and literature, you know, even the political works, one's kind of compelled to sort of say, is this actually promoting uh, a rigorous critique of society or is it in some way uh, uh, masking that? in a series of deceptions, emotional appeals, et cetera. So I think this is still, uh, interestingly, this is thousands of years ago that this debate took place, but I think that pretty much it still governs the contours for those of us who are concerned with using the reading and study and teaching of literature to create a better world. Thank you. And then I can take some uh, questions or comments if anyone would like to. Thank you for the welcoming. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Thoughts? Audience, questions, please. Okay, so let me uh, set the ball rolling. Uh, David, uh, you talked about this ancient quarrel between Plato and Aristotle, uh, which actually figures in all literary theories that came after them and you did a wonderful job by looking at this quarrel also ret retrospectively. And uh, at one point you referred uh, that it is a reference point 
even to the current crisis if i heard you correctly to the current crisis going on in the humanity is these days particularly in the states so would you talk about this a little bit uh, more how this debate uh, is a point of reference for the discussion on the crisis in the humanities uh, right thank you i mean well again i don't know if this is the same in india um but in the united states like humanities departments literature departments english departments uh are all receiving smaller and smaller amounts of resources and funding uh there've been some important books that have argued that you know the whole traditional uh discipline of literary studies may just become obsolete even by people like for example john gillery uh, uh an important uh historian of uh literary analysis and of these disciplines argues in a recent book um that uh you know basically television and 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 the need for this what we call in the united states at least the stem uh disciplines like science technology engineering and mathematics are really going to grow but the ideas that at least some of us hold dear of you know literature and the humanities serving to develop and expand our understanding of what it means to be human giving us the the distance to think about deep social problems the ability to uh develop empathy and understanding of other people and other cultures this is not really a priority <laughs> uh, it just really isn't uh to the degree that many of us fear that you know 20 40 years you know our departments will be you know skeletons of what they once were so to me that's um based on a couple of different factors um it's interesting because in american society at least with movies and television we constantly get these uh works that sort of show the problems of social divisions and inequality of wealth that kind of critique various kinds of intolerance and and racism and yet they often have this way of recuperating at the end the system you know like if it's a critique of uh police brutality there's some individual who actually is not uh fully uh problematic or corrupt and they are the one good guy who saves things or um you know i mean uh frederick jameson famously said that it's more easy for us in our culture to imagine the destruction of all the human race than to imagine a transformation in the economic system and yet you know um you know the question gets asked like are you guys just dealing with literature and these things because you like it or does it really teach someone something as important as the pragmatic skills they might get to get a job in a diminishing uh, job market so for me um i think that this really does require that we think about these questions in a long and historical sense not just um the immediate because in a strange way as long as there's been the arts and the humanities there's been strong counter arguments that we need to understand and employ uh and utilize so to me this is a very important question uh for what we're doing and for the future because i would not like to see personally a world in which you know education gets reduced to merely job training or pragmatic purposes where it's not possible for humanists and people in the humanities to continue to try to think through in deep ways uh what is really going on in society with separation from the immediate demands that maybe other fields have i don't know if 
what I'm saying makes any sense here, but that's the motivations behind this 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 kind of presentation. Thank you. Uh, questions from your side, audience? Upasana? Okay, um, I got someone here who said, uh, this lecture was really insightful and with reference to Derrida, Sassur, Butler, Kant, Said, and the description of the a priori, the debate between Plato and Aristotle is quite clear now. And the mentioning of films in the explanation of the same was very, really interesting. Thank you. That's a very nice, uh, nice compliment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that we do need to kind of move amongst these things uh, for sure. I see that... Um, Ripti, you have a question? Go ahead. Um, so Tripti has got a question. If you can, um, uh, Tripti, you can unmute yourself, my dear. Yeah, can you hear me, ma'am? Um, if it is comfortable for you, you can uh, uh, ask the question to Dr. Anshan, or you may also write uh, your question in the chat box, whichever is comfortable. Oh, okay, ma'am. Hi, sir. Good evening. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear all of that. Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? I'm sorry? Can you sorry. hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Good evening. So you talked about the artistic representation as a copy. And you said three types of beds. If you could just describe it once again about the three, three types, types of, of beds. 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 I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing the specific question. What, uh, what did she ask? Um, she asked about uh, your, uh, you, you talking about imitation and the three kinds of beds. B-E-D-S. Mm -hmm. You mean the three objections that Plato offers? Yeah, yeah. The question is about that. Right. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's important. I mean, Plato basically first of all says that uh that uh art is fundamentally an imitation aristotle also says it's an imitation but aristotle says because it's an imitation it can teach us because if for example we're in a really bad situation that's not the moment where we can think or evaluate but that like theater tragedy drama done correctly allows us to evaluate this now plato starts off by saying you know in a very philosophical way that you know um these things are are not real uh they're works of fiction they're imitations of an original but he makes the the proviso most of us might say if something's an imitation of the original we might say well the original is what we inhabit in the physical world of time and space for Plato, uh, who's, uh, you know, the primary first sort of original religious thinker, the world that we live in is is an inadequate copy. Uh, and, you know, he makes a couple points that are undoubtedly true and that others have made uh, as critiques of like simple, naive views of uh, of the world. Like, for example, you know, we, we you know, look at a, a stick in water and it appears to bend, but it doesn't really bend. So, you know, he's arguing that like truth uh, is is really only uh, worthy of being considered truth if it's universally true and if it's true beyond just a given moment. Uh, his idea of truth is a much more absolutist idea of truth. And he believes, you know, as like, for example, his, his uh, famous allegory of the cave, which I didn't talk about, but which is directly related to this, that the world we know through our senses is very limited and false. So on the first level, every single thing that uh, in the imagination is in a sense by definition not true. So Plato says whether this is a good argument or not, therefore it's going to mislead us. Uh, again, the second thing that he does is he kind of explains that, you know, if you read Homer, for example, epics, a lot of different things are described. Uh, customs, uh, chariot racing, uh, wars, tournaments, uh, government uh, strategies, war strategies, tactics, etc. 
And 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 Plato says, well, how could any writer know this? Uh, and you know, uh, sometimes I have met professional writers and been under impressed with them. Sometimes a writer is not able to explain the brilliance of their work very well. Sometimes there's a disconnect. And so in, in the Ion, uh, Plato says, well, maybe this is not really the writer. This is divine inspiration, which actually contradicts his argument that it's completely false because if it was divine inspiration. It would theoretically be true. But his point is, is that like writers don't know about what they write. If they knew about what they write, wrote, they would be living their lives on those on the principles of what they're writing about. So if you have a writer who writes about war uh, and assuming that you thought the wars were just, if there is going to be uh, any validity to their descriptions and analysis, they should know something about it. And, you know, this is also a valid criticism. I mean, in the United States, we've had, you know, uh, a long period of, say, uh, w movies uh, that were Westerns, for example, about, you know, the settling of the West and the conflict with the Native Americans in the United States. And they're not based on a, an accurate understanding of the history uh, of these things. They're very mythological and they're mythological in ways that justify injustice. So that's so, you know, Plato's point in the most positive sense is he's saying these guys don't know what they're talking about. And if they did know what they were talking about, they may still be serving evil causes. The, the third, and I think in some ways the most interesting, is, is his argument that, you know, uh, arts overwhelm us. They take, a, you know, Kant talks about the sublime, you know, which is when your sense of normalcy breaks down in the face of something so uh, overwhelming, uh, whether in nature or in art. Uh, but, you know, the the arts appeal to our emotions. And that is a, a concern for, for Plato because he believes that rational thinking means separating yourself from your emotions and being able to look at a situation or a crisis or a problem in a calm, cool, collected way. So he argues that, you know, the, the 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 attention that people give the you know one of the things that's interesting that that may have partially really uh, irritated Plato is Sophocles was consistently you know won uh, these awards uh, contests was voted like the best um, you know tragic tra tra tradition in in these contests in Greece and um, um, he became also elected to the government as a leader of the government. And so you can imagine, Plato was basically, you know, who believes philosophers should run the government as philosopher kings in the Republic must have felt like uh, almost like a slap in the face. Like this guy writes some good plays and he knows more than me. I've been, you know, studying when, with, so with Socrates and devoting my whole life to thinking. So, you know, there's this, that's, that's part of the, the rivalry. The, the quarrel is, you know, both the people who create or appreciate works of art thinking their material is the road to wisdom and Plato thinking the study of wisdom is the road to wisdom and that these things are dealing with the imagination. And if you're dealing with the imagination, you can both uh, overwhelm and seduce the audience into values that are bad and uh, the people who really should be running things the smartest and the best, the philosopher kings, are not because the masses will go with whatever is popular, whatever stirs their feelings. It's also to some degree related to the critique that Plato and Aristotle have, to, to, you know, to a lesser degree of rhetoric. You know, the politicians and speakers who use poetic devices to convince their audience uh, or use rhetorical devices. Uh, just, which they saw as deception. Again, the real irony, though, is when you read Plato, his work is exciting and it's poetic and it's characters engaged in dialogue and debate. Aristotle is kind of like reading a medical textbook. He dissects all the different features and forms and variations. And then Aristotle argues, you know, in a historical way, certain kinds of uh, developments have led to effective art uh, and others failed.
so another difference is that Aristotle is being very, like, is observing and uh, evaluating on the basis of history, whereas Plato is deducing on the basis of certain kinds of uh, a priori concepts. So I don't know if that, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. But David, I have a query. Uh, don't you think uh, Plato's valorization of the ideal world or the divine world, you know, the way he philosophy, philosophizes about it, the divine world, isn't the divine world itself a figment of imagination? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> it is a figment no. of imagination. Right? So yeah. I think uh, to take the divine world as ideal, at least literary writers, they have seen the world, they have seen the society, and this is what they represent. I doubt. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I'm sorry. That that is a very good point. I mean, he's writing the Republic precisely because he's disenchanted, to put it mildly, with the developments in the various struggles in Greece. I mean, there was the period that was the the tyrants, the thirty tyrants that replaced the democracy. There was occupation. So, Plato is. Plato is, is ironically very poetic. Again, uh, Aristotle is quite boring to read, in my opinion, although his ideas are, are very good, because he, he writes in a very dry, objective kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of categorical, systematic way. Uh, Plato, um, you know, is, is more like reading Nietzsche or something. It's, 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 it's almost like Plato is close to... Um, himself being an imaginative poet. There is, a, there is a question. What is the question? Yeah. Sir, the question is, uh, in the literary domain, why is the assumed overwhelming influences of art in general and poetry in particular considered not so worthwhile? Uh, do talk about that a little if you could. Sure, sure. Um, well, it's because, um, you know, Plato's major concern is ethics. And, you know, it's, it's again, in the Republic, it's to create a rational society. And so in a very simple sense, Plato believes uh, the poetic and the artistic is irrational. I mean, it's, he, you know, uh, he thinks that it's childish. It's, it's playing at things and not facing things as they really are. Now, I mean, I should say, I, I don't agree with Plato on this. I mean, I'm not sympathetic to that. I I think it's it's kind of absurd and uh, in a certain way. I mean, he, he wants to create a just society. Now, again, it's an interesting question because, remember, Plato also uh, wrote the Apology, where Socrates, uh, who advocates wisdom, def ref you know, refuses to accept the authority of the state and the government. And again, reading that is like reading a story of a condemned man, you know? Uh, it's, I mean, uh, but for Plato, the world demands, in his mind, the highest kind of access to truth. And he doesn't believe that we really can get to that with works of the imagination, even though, as uh, uh, Barendra, as, as Dr. Pandey was saying, his very idea of the ideal realm of forms is kind of an imaginary one. It's not like one you would ever encounter. Uh, it's not one that's practical. It's an assumption. Uh, it's a religious assumption. I mean, that's why when Catholicism took over Europe, you know, Plato was so useful to them. Uh, because Plato, you know, Aristotle also, but Plato was already kind of developing the, you know, the fear that many people have that if you have strong emotions, you won't be able to control yourself. Like the fear that, you know, for example, you know, if the content of a movie shows violence, then young people are going to learn violence is acceptable. Or if there's something inappropriate uh, sexually for uh, a young person and they encounter it, 
they're going to go off and become distorted forever. It's it's kind of the in my opinion it's a it's a fear uh, of the you know be, the power of art. I mean, art can you know can truly overwhelm us. You know, uh, it can transform our whole emotional and even and it and it has cognitive implications. I mean, again, other people later, like for example, the philosopher um, Schiller argues that play uh, is our ambition for a better world. That's also what Freud says. Freud says the reason that we tell stories is because we're not happy. So we create fantasies, but we distance ourselves from our fantasies because we're afraid of our fantasies. Some of our desires are not necessarily ones that we want to go with. So we create stories which allow us to live out our, our our fantasies, but no one gets hurt. You know, think about the way that people enjoy sometimes reading a a work of true crime or a novel told from the point of view of the murderer. Um, the the idea these that, that that these have is that if we enjoy that, that we're somehow going to gain the wrong lesson, rather than you know what most people would would I think say which is we do enjoy these things. We enjoy them vicariously, but we do distinguish between what's real and what's imaginary. So just because I might enjoy reading crime fiction or reading fiction about murderers doesn't mean, or reading Edgar Allan Poe doesn't mean I want to, uh, you know, bury someone alive and, uh, and torment them uh, because they insulted me. It's more like, um, you know, in Aristotle or in some readings, it's more like it's a safe way to kind of indulge in our in our in our imagination. And you know, Plato, like Freud, uh, thinks that our imagination often contains ugly, negative, false things. So that's why he wants to control it, or believes that any kind of just society would not allow the free access of these ideas. You know, on the other hand, you know, many people have felt that the goal of a just society is to narrow the gap between the world of art and the world of our daily existence. I mean, if we remove all the art and poetry from our lives, I haven't talked much about aesthetic pleasure, but I think it's an extremely important thing that if we had more time would be worth, you know, exploring in this question as well. If we were to remove aesthetic pleasure, our lives would be greatly impoverished uh, in so many ways. I mean, I'm not even sure human beings could do that, but that is the reason, as far as I understand, that there is this concern that you mentioned uh, about these things that most of us do believe are, are both valuable on an individual level and even valuable in society. I mean, we can certainly think of certain uh, books that have brought about you know, positive things. Uh, in the United States context, uh, Abraham Lincoln famously said to uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's um, uh, Ca uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was one of the books that really transformed uh, uh, a lot of public sent uh, sentiments about slavery. Uh, he famously said when he met her, you're the little woman who started this war. Uh, you know, we can also think about the ways that we might have been influenced by books that, uh, you know, defend human rights in the broadest sense. Um, but when you're dealing with the arts, when you're dealing with, with emotions, when you're dealing with powerful aesthetic effects, there are dangers too. And so, you know, in some ways, I think we, we don't want to make it an either or. We want to somehow think out what kinds of culture and art uh, are are both valuable aesthetically and ethically. So, Upasana, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. This has been a really insightful talk. 
uh so i had this question since you spoke about the pragmatics of literature so if we take uh, into consideration let's say the pragmatics of humanities as a whole so there was this instance where in one of the indian universities there was a professor of political sciences he uh, he pub- he uh, he was in the process of publishing this paper which was extremely critical of the present government and uh, it was systematically you know removed from the database of the university and even the professor was discouraged to uh, go ahead with the publication of that particular paper because the university did not want to take that uh, you know that risk uh, with uh, by publishing it so when s- things like this happen uh, do don't we realize that uh, you know uh, the 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 work which is produced in the field of discipline of humanities it still carries this impact and uh, maybe the uh, pow- the people in power the structures of power they are aware of it and uh, the this uh, obsolescence that we are uh, currently facing right now this uh, loss of uh, you know importance that we are currently going through right now maybe it is just a systematic way to once again repress the marginalized voices because they know that we have that power with our words and with our research maybe we can you know uh, call out or be critical of uh, the current political situation the current economic situation and maybe this uh, l- uh, re- reduction of let's say funds or making it sound less important it's just another systematic way of uh, suppressing the voices i think that's right i i agree with you 100% on that uh, that comment and question i mean yes uh when um governments or societies have injustice or uh have some kind of um when there's a political structure or an economic structure or power structure that wants to um uh you know maintain its authority they do often um go after critics they do often utilize i mean again plato's ideas can and have been used to justify, you know, dictatorship and so forth. And, you know, some of that is is what he probably is motivated by. And it is a it is an issue. I mean, it's exactly why, you know, hopefully we can get to a situation where, you know, people do have the right to have free um research and free uh expression. But yes, when you know it's 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 interesting because if you if you write poems or something and no one reads them uh, and they have no impact then usually governments are okay with that but when you start to say things that actually have impact or that challenge the existing uh order that's when the order says okay well this idea of freedom of speech that we were talking about or academic freedom that's when it becomes more problematic you know they when when ideas are considered dangerous that's when there there's an attempt to prohibit them when i say dangerous i don't mean objectively dangerous i mean dangerous to the people in power so i think your point is 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 very very good and i and exactly right and it's one of the reasons also that you know at least when we're i mean political science is a is a direct field that directly deals with politics you know literature and cultural analysis does so in an indirect way and in a less um obvious way which has its drawbacks from the point of view of political change but it also has its advantages from the point of view of political change uh you know bertolt brecht said uh, you have to be cunning in order to lie and what he meant is not that we should lie but that you know he was writing in the context of repression in germany during the uh, rise of hitler and so uh you know one of the things that's interesting is the way that sometimes you know the the truth can be conveyed in art not in such a way as to be so direct that the authorities go after you and shut you down but in ways that can plant seeds that are more uh subtle but i i do think you're you're right a lot of what this comes down to and this is another reason that you know plato you know needs to be in a certain sense rejected is because it it is really comes and it often just comes down to you know the people in power don't want certain ideas discussed straight up and if they if they are they're going to be 
there's going to be consequences, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully, we will someday have a world where that's not the case, um, but we're not there yet. Okay, Devanjali ji, should we wind up now? Uh, I think so. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Anshan, for this lovely talk. We have had our undergrad and the postgrad students, and Upasana is a PhD scholar who is, uh, you know, so he is, she is pursuing her PhD under uh, the supervision of Dr. Pandey. So it was really a treat listening to you. And uh, once again, I would like to thank all the participants. I would like to thank uh, the Dean of the School of Language and Literature uh, for organizing this wonderful lecture series. So on this note, sir, with your permission, if we could end this uh, uh, meeting. Sure. And thank you for all of your, your kindness and your warmth and your openness to hear my talk. Uh, thank you I so much. Thank you. It's been thank a really so. great. Thank you. Okay.